Welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, episode 4 with Steve Pluj. My name is Donny. I'm the host of the Free Dive Cafe. Let's sit down and go really deep with some of the deepest humans on Earth. The Free Dive Cafe is long form interviews that get into the backstories, the training, the challenges, the passions and fears and personal philosophies of those who choose to adventure on one breath. The Free Dive Cafe can be found at freedivecafe.com. All the episodes and show notes are there, and someday there will be more content of a free divery nature to feast on, so bookmark the page and subscribe to the podcast to keep up to date. You can listen to the podcast directly through the website or through iTunes, the Stitcher app, and some other providers. If you can't find the podcast on your favorite provider, let me know and I'll try and fix it. If you listen to the podcast and you really like it, please, please, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star review. It really helps increase the visibility of the podcast and makes it available to more people. So far we have no reviews, but almost a thousand downloads in the two weeks since we launched. So come on guys, take a minute and go to iTunes and say how great the show is. Go to the Facebook page and like that too. That's at facebook.com slash freedivecafepodcast. If you have friends who love freediving, share the episodes with them on Facebook and Twitter. And let's make the Free Dive Cafe a place where we can all get together and learn more about free diving. The Facebook page is also a great place to keep up to date about who's appearing on the show. And as always, if you have any comments or suggestions, go to the website and leave a message through the contact page. To those of you who have already taken the time to sit down and write some feedback, thank you so, so much. I love everything you have to say and you warm my heart. Today I'm giving a little shout out to a fellow, well I think it's a fellow, he or she, goes by the name of Morten Solemsley. Morten, I don't know who you are or where you're from, but this week you became a legend in my world. You became the first official patron of the Free Dive Cafe podcast through the Patreon page. Morten pledged $5 a month to support the show and for that I salute you my friend. So Morten is leading the way, why not follow in his footsteps? And head over to the website and click that blue link that says support the podcast or you can go to patreon.com slash freedivecafe. You can support the podcast for as little as one dollar per month and you will accelerate my dream of turning the freedive cafe into the bastion of freediving knowledge for years to come. Okay so holy holy crapsicles I'm looking at almost 1000 downloads of the podcast in the first two weeks. That blows my mind, it warms my heart and I'm sending my love to everyone who is enjoying the show and taking the time to listen. Thank you so, so much. So a lot of people have been asking when the next episode is. So for future reference, I'm aiming for a minimum of two episodes a month. That's all. That's about as much as I can manage right now. I made a promise on my Patreon page that if I reach 50 patrons, I'll start the monthly Q&A sessions. But until that time, expect roughly two a month, maybe three if I get a long weekend to do some extra work. On today's episode, we have Stig Pluj. Stig, sorry for butchering your name, but it's your fault for having an impossible Danish name anyway, sorry. Stig is 44 years old. He's a trained chimney sweep, believe it or not, who went into early retirement in 2010 due to a terrible condition known as psoriatic arthritis. He started free diving in 2013 and eventually became an IDA instructor. He's achieved eight national records for Denmark. He got a bronze medal at the World Championships in 2015 and a silver medal at Vertical Blue last year. What is so special, so amazing about Stig's story is the way he has transformed his life and taken control of his health through freediving, yoga and eating a plant-based diet. The hardships he has suffered and the path to freedom make up an amazing story and Stig is here to candidly share it with us. Before we listen, let me just say, I discovered there was a big problem with Stig's audio track when I came to edit everything together, so the sound is not 100%, and that's just the way it is. I did my best to pull it all together and make it listenable, but I'm sure all you kind souls can see past the dodgy sound quality to the inspiring story Stig has to tell and enjoy it fully. Okay, let's dive. So 
So welcome to the Free Dive Cafe, Stig. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and talk about your free diving journey. So you're from Denmark, Stig. Yeah. And uh, before your reinvention, let's say, as a world-class free diver, you were a chimney sweep, right? Yeah, I actually have my own company. Um, I was finishing it in Denmark. It, it would take four years to be a chimney sweeper. And when I was finished with that in 2001, I was working as a regular chimney sweeper for, for a year. And then I started up my own company where I was uh, selling fireplaces, chimneys, uh, repairing old houses and stuff. Did a lot of people still have coal in Denmark at the time? Yeah, uh, they're, they're having fireplaces where they're, they're using regular wood. Um, because it's cold in Denmark <laughs> and it's, it's a nice way to get a nice warm house with, with um, fireplaces. So it's, it's a big thing in Denmark. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm from Scotland originally. Um, mm -hmm. pretty cold there too. And I yeah. remember we had a, we had a cold fireplace in, uh, in our house when I was growing yeah. up and, uh, you know, we'd wake up in the morning, uh, freezing cold. And the first thing we had to do was kind of gather around the fireplace and, <laughs> Like we had to, you know, like wrap up pieces of newspaper and start the fire and then bring the cold, in, the coal in from outside. And it was so dirty and messy. But once you actually had that fire going, you know, it was such a beautiful space around the fireplace and such a nice heat and you didn't actually want to leave it, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice way to get the, the warm in the house. It's, um, it's nice and dry and it's, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Mm -hmm. So you didn't start free diving until you were about 40. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's a shame, man. Eh? Well, I don't know. I think you're doing pretty good for that. Uh, can you tell us how you went from being this uh, in the chimney business to being a free diver at the age of 40? Because I understand it was um, a difficult transition related to a health problem that you had and something yeah. to do with a condition known as psoriatic arthritis. Well, when 2008, um, my com company was... I was I was working a lot, uh, easy 60, 70 hours a week, and, and I still have my family. I have two kids. I have a wife, and you know, a big house and everything. So uh, I, I was working too much, and um, I was stressed up really badly. Suddenly, my my body reacts in, in a really weird way. I, I started getting pain all over in my knees and my hands, my uh, joints everywhere where, <laughs> where I have a joint it was just starting swallowing up and it was really really painful and I went of course to the doctor and asked well, what is this uh, get it away <laughs> give me some pills so I can start working again and they were putting on um, a lot of painkillers and um, they were taking a lot of blood samples just to figure out what, what was wrong with me suddenly they come up with this Psoriatic get righteous thing. Then they start getting me on chemotherapy. You get that from this disease. Oh, really? Yeah, it's it's um it's not as heavy as a cancer patient, but it's 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 on the way up there. It's still pretty serious. And, yeah, yeah, it is. And and I all the side effects you get from there, I got everything from it. So I had I was taking the pills every Monday. So from Monday to Friday, it was just terrible. Like you have a flu, you know, nauseous all the time, everything and really, really tired. And then you have two days where it was a little bit better, but you have a lot of pain. So you're putting on more painkillers. It was just getting worse and worse and worse. And then in 2010, uh, I gave up my company. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't walk. <laughs> I was walking around with sticks. I was sitting in a wheelchair. Um, and it was, it was a pretty heavy time. Yeah, and so things went downhill for you very steeply. It made me really so badly fast that I couldn't, sometimes I was like, is this real? You know? Yeah. Sounds terrible. Yeah. And, um, I got divorced, uh, lost my house, my company, everything just getting worse and worse and worse. And, uh, Starting hating myself, the people around me. Uh, I couldn't sleep because of all this uh, really bad pain. So it, it was just really a bad nightmare. And the doctors keep on getting 
uh, new medicine in and and try new medicine. Sometimes some of it was working for but for for a period of maybe two or three months, and then it's it didn't it just went wrong again. And some people with that disease have this thing they cannot that the medicine is not working uh, as it should. So it was putting more painkillers on me, um, and I was moving less and less, just sitting in my couch, you know, watching television and. So you really hit uh, hit rock bottom, so to speak. Yeah, totally. And my identity was 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 totally gone. I was mm. this thing with being a dad and being a man. <laughs> yeah, you know, everything was just uh, actually totally gone. And I think because I was at so low a point of my life, if, uh, small changes that that makes making one feel good, yeah. it just it was a really really big thing. Um, here in Denmark, we have some special hospitals. When you have this kind of disease, you can get into this hospital. You can be there for two, three, four, five, six weeks in a row. And you get trained by a specialist and you get in a big warm water pool so you can be in weightless and, and doing some gymnastic in the water pool. And that was really nice. Um, but it was with a lot of old people. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it was... A little bit weird, but uh, but this thing with the with the warm water floating around doing gymnastic in the water, it was really nice. And I have for the first time in, in three years a, a good feeling with myself uh, because I, I was weightless in the water and stuff. And I want to practice this when I get home from the hospital. And I was getting into the local swimming pool, but the water was too cold and. Uh, it was not so relaxing. Um, and then there was a guy asking me why you can buy a wetsuit. And then you can go in the water and maybe do the gymnastic there. If you have this disease and you start freezing, then you get more pain. So I needed to keep me warm. And, and I think, what a wetsuit here. Why not just, just one try it? Because it was really, really feeling good. So I bought this wetsuit and... Um, it was a hell to get it on. It <laughs> took me two, almost 20 minutes sometimes. <laughs> because I put it my knees. It was just, uh, but when I was in there, it was, was fine. And, and I was enjoying the water, uh, being weightless and could do some gymnastics and stuff. Uh, and in some kind of way, I was on the internet searching for some spear fishing. And the guy that I bought the wetsuit from, he, he wanted to sell me a lot of stuff. So he had the spear. <laughs> <laughs> some long fins and stuff. Yeah, I cannot do that. But it was a little bit interesting. Maybe I could go and kill something. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it don't have done anything for so many years. It's like all my friends were starting uh, mountain biking and, and stuff, but I was just sitting there. So if I can go out in the sea and maybe kill something, it could be pretty cool. So I was looking up the spear fishing on, uh, on YouTube. And when suddenly I saw a video of a guy swimming in the pool on the water, and um, it was going really slowly. Mm -hmm. I think it was with spy fins or something, but it was, I think, wow, that's, I want to do this. <laughs> Maybe I should try and do this. I have a wet soap now, and I just need some lead, and then I have been a swimmer for many years. I, 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 st I stopped when I was 12 years, <laughs> but I've been in the swimming pool for since I was three or something, swimming with my mom, and then when I was 12, I, yeah, I didn't want it anymore. But so uh, I have some technique, and maybe I, I can do this um, thing on the water. You had some like uh, talent or ability left over from when you were a child. It was kind of like in your system already. Yeah, so I was really enjoying the water all the time. So it's maybe I'll just try this, and it, it seems pretty cool what they were doing. And um, and I really missed something to do a little bit more than gymnastic, <laughs> you know. And I was out to buy some long uh, fins, and I was trying to just swimming from one lane to the other. And so, would you just go to the swimming pool on your own and uh, practice yeah, this totally uh, free diving? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was doing. It just <laughs> I do the same thing I do on the video, just on the water, and try to get to the other end of the pool. Uh, yeah, suddenly I can swim two lanes, fifty meters, and I was I was starting to talk about when I was getting home from the swimming pool to my kids and said, whoa, you know what I can do? Uh, you know, just 
telling the, my kids that I could do something, it was for them it seemed well, well, it's pretty weird. <laughs> but but uh, for me, it was a big thing just to say something else that I was just laying in the sofa and just watching television. Now I can tell I've been in the pool. I actually dived two lanes in the pool, and I was pretty proud about that. So, what what age were your kids at this time? Uh, it's they were six and uh, eight. So it was very important for you to kind of show them that you were uh, that you were getting on and doing something and being active. Exactly, because I know I have <laughs> I was been reading a lot about what happened to people when they're getting sick and what it was doing to the, the kids they have. And um, it, it was really bad reading. So I, I need to do some, show them I can do something. So um, so they can be a, maybe a little bit inspired of something. I don't know. It was really important for me to uh, just could show that I can do something else and just laying there and being in the bad mood all the time. But another thing, it was I was feeling really nice afterwards. It was um, like there was some kind of pain releasing in it. Mm -hmm. Some kind of a therapy, a physical therapy. Yeah, involved, it was. Yeah. It, it was. It was so nice to breathe again afterwards, and I feel I have more energy. Um, so I can just keep on doing this, uh, and after uh, I don't know two or three weeks or something, I can do a breath hold for two minutes. And I was still doing this thing on my own. Um, and then I contacted a guy in Copenhagen that was an EDA instructor. And um, I went to Copenhagen, I was doing an EDA instructor two stars. And I was just totally blown away. He managed to get me doing a breath hold for three and a half minutes. And I was like, wow, <laughs> it felt even better, you know, it was just like, I was starting flying. Something. Right. So you went to uh, Copenhagen. You did the, your first uh, IDA course. And that was your first uh, formal free diving lessons. Exactly. And it was actually the 25th of January, 2013. Right. So you remember the date. Exactly. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Um, and he said, maybe I should get in touch with a club and start free diving. Maybe you, you're good at this. and You should try it. Do some more about it. And I contacted the club in Odense and I, yeah, started freediving. Yeah. So you, did you also do the, um, I mean, uh, excuse my uh, ignorance here, but Denmark doesn't really, it doesn't seem, it's not the first place that jumps to mind when I think about freediving. So did you actually do the IDA course in the waters off of Copenhagen? It was just in the pool. Um, yeah, we did everything we could in the pool and that was, was it. So, so it was just... I just want to know what it was, and, and I was doing a lot of things wrong, and I can see that after the, this course, and, and it was nice to get in touch with this club so I can <laughs> do this with, with some other people, you know? So, yeah, I, I started uh, in this club right away, and I think it was training three times, <laughs> and then the daily championship was coming up in the pool. <laughs> and, uh, they said, you should join us. You should join in on the competition. Wow. <laughs> it's a little bit too early. I've been trained three times now. <laughs> uh, but uh, I rented, uh, went there anyway, and um, it was really amazing. And I just totally fall in love with it. Uh, I remember I have done dynamic no fins. I did 65 in training. Uh, uh, and but they were keeping on saying, it. on this, when there's competition going on, there's safety divers, there's doctors. You just, you should just enjoy the water and just let it go. And just don't think too much. Just if you, everything feels right, just continues. And, um, I did 111 meters. <laughs> uh, that's was, incredible. Yeah. And I was really shocked about myself. Like, wow. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was. Yeah, totally exploded by energy and it was so you went from 60 meters uh to 111 meters in, in one yeah. dive super crazy um uh, and yeah I, I was really blown away about it and um uh, yeah and just totally fall in love with this freediving thing 
Um, but yeah, I have seen the, the movie The Big Blue, <laughs> uh, but it never like I was when it, when I saw it, like should I do this? I've never had this thought about free diving. I think it was a really cool movie, but I rented it again and I was seeing it I don't know ten times for a week. And uh, I think I, I should do this deep diving thing. Really try uh, to really get into it. So had you had you done any depth training at all before your um, before your no, no. competition? No. Yeah, that's another uh, another thing to it. When just before I started free diving, uh, we were talking about changing my diet to eating vegetables like being vegetarian instead because it may be some people saying that it could have a big influence on uh, my disease right. actually maybe it could be better than that. yeah uh, but I've been my grandfather was a butcher you know so yeah. in vegetables was a pretty weird thing <laughs> um, but I was reading more and more about it and I thought maybe I should just to, to try this uh, See, see if this can do something else. Um, so I actually started changing my diet and free diving and started a little bit of yoga at the same time. So this all kind of uh, the, the diet change and um, the free diving and the yoga kind of like came together at the same time? Yeah. Uh, actually, I was starting in the pool, you know, and um, my kids was talking to some of her kids, some of her friends in the school. And uh, one of the fathers of them is an Israeli, and he he was a yoga instructor. And uh, he was, yeah, coming banging on my door once and saying, can I please tell you something? Maybe it could be a little bit uh, better for your breath hold, and maybe it would be good for you. And uh, he was teaching me how to do my breathing, which is a lot of pranayama. And I was, yeah, just started with that. When, when when he was there, and I was doing panayama in my warm bathtub almost every night. Um, because laying in the warm water, it was pain releasing, and doing this panayama thing, it just it was really nice. And yeah, actually, I just started meditating. I didn't know I was doing that. I was just doing this because he said I could hold my breath for longer if I do this, and I just keep on doing it. And after a few weeks with this Panayama thing, I just got this idea now, I don't want any kind of medicine anymore. I really want to see if I can get something more out of life. And, uh, and this diet thing, if it can help, it, it could be really cool. Now I got this place in the warm water uh, doing Panayama. It, it, it was totally pain releasing. Uh, when I was doing static in the pool, it was also pain releasing. I was have no pain. It was just like a space I can go to uh, to get rid of everything. You know, so it, it was easier to have the pain through the day if if I know I, when I go in your water, everything is gone again. You already saw the possibility that you could heal yourself without medication. That there was something that you could do with your mind and your body that would be much more effective than the medication that you were taking. Exactly, and and with, with no side effects. Uh, and then that was, we, it was, it, it was so bad, all the side effects, because at, in the end, I got the chemotherapy and some biologic medicine and some painkillers. I got methadone, pure morphine, and something called gabapentine. And this cocktail, you know, it was like, I didn't know if I was playing with my kids or if it was a dream or anything, though. Um, it was, I really want my life back, you know, and then um, I was ready to have a lot of pain through the whole day, but if I can go in the water and be pain released, it was okay with me. So I just took a chance, quit all the medicine once from one day to the other. That was pretty crazy too, actually. So, so what happened? Uh, did you have a re really bad time when you first oh, gave yeah. up the medication? Um, I, um, I couldn't sleep for 10 days. Mm-hmm. And it was the pain was just exploding. I couldn't control anything. I was crying. I was laughing. I was, it was, it was really, really weird. I was scratching inside of my bones. It was, it was terrible, but I was using the warm bathtub. I just laying there 
uh, almost the whole day uh, and just do pranayama and, and it, it, it helped me through this but I, I will never do that again it was it, it was real terrible and my doctor said yeah, I should do it over three months but it was just like no one way I want my life now just I have to do it now and I saw a movie once when the uh, a guy was doing the same thing and it was really looking easy, but it was on a movie and everything is easy on a movie. <laughs> well, but after three months, um, actually starting to getting much better. I was getting rid of my sticks and the wheelchair, starting walking really slowly in the beginning, but it was improving every day. Uh, and the yoga thing was helping me to get some of the stiffness away from my joints. So had, had you started to practice yoga every day, like uh, yoga postures, yoga asana? Yeah, so, so just something I find on YouTube, you know, and I can do this and I'm just trying it. But then I, I, I heard about a place that have hot yoga. You're doing yoga on, in infra, infrared. Mm -hmm. It's a Bikram, right? Yeah, you can, well, yeah, Bikram. And there's also just hot yoga. It's, it's, they're just doing something else. But that was amazing what they did because of the heat. My, my joints was really loving it <laughs> kind of way. And uh, my stiffness was getting really fast away from my, my joints. Afterwards, I know I heard that they're actually using infrared heat to get uh, inflammations away from joints. So, and I'm still practicing hot yoga and doing it two to one, one or two times a week. And that's really keeping the stiffness away from my joints. Yeah, and then I started everything in quite the same period, but I was really hooked on this freediving thing, especially after the Danish championship. And I was searching for a place I can try this deep diving thing. And um, then I find Jonathan Sonics. He was in Egypt this time. <laughs> I was calling up, telling, you know, I want to do this, and I've done this and this. And I was... Yeah, uh, doing three stars and four stars. So uh, Johnny was your coach for your three star and four star courses? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, definitely. I'll never regret this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was going to Egypt and then um, it, it was really cool going to Daha. Starting training and he was telling me everything that I have to do about equalizing and how we should go down and so it's safe and by lanyards and everything we uh, it's in the three and four stars and um my, my first dive <laughs> it was uh it was it was quite fun because he, he has set the rope you know uh, it, it was uh, it was 70 no sorry uh, 37 meters the rope and i just should go down and just feel how it feels and do my equalization and try to relax and go up again. And I think normally when people do this at the first time, they maybe go to max 10 meters or something. He said I should relax, keep my chin in, and just try to equalize. And and he showed me how to equalize, and yeah, it should be easy. And this relaxing thing, all this pain for this long period, have really teach me how to relax like instantly relax uh, because it's, it's so much with pain religion. So I just totally relaxed. Uh, I have my bike fins on. I'm swimming down. And he said if I can feel something that I get heavy in the water, I just try to fall down in the water, just free fall. And suddenly I could feel I was a little bit heavier. I said, oh, cool. Uh, and I start falling in the water. And suddenly I get stopped, like something was pulling in my legs. And there was... The line, the, the line was not, it was not long enough. <laughs> you, you'd gone to the end of the line. Yeah, so I went to 40 meters. <laughs> for the first time. I managed to get to 60 meters in this uh, period. I was there for two weeks. And I tried no fins the last day I was there uh, for 45 meters. It was really nice. I was like, wow, that's really cool discipline. Yeah, totally fall in love with this deep diving thing. And uh, I was getting home again. I felt amazing when I come home. It was like I didn't feel like I was having pain, you know, it was like I was feeling like a totally new man again. So physically you had undergone some kind of uh some kind of transformation like you had uh, really like transcended your illness to a certain extent. Yeah, and I also think I was really high on what I was 
yeah. what I have done. I know, like, I've not been doing anything for almost five years, and suddenly I was doing something people think was really crazy. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, 45 uh, meters, no fins, and 60 meters. Yeah. I mean, this is like, uh, it could take uh, some people years to get to that level, and it seems that you must have had a um, quite a talent for it. Yes, sometimes that I, I really just enjoy to being in the water. <laughs> But, but it was such a big change that I, I was, when I get home, I was, the doctors, they have been wrong. I have not this disease. It cannot be right. I cannot go down, do this and, and have this disease. It cannot be possible. So I actually start to start living again, like the way I was living before, eating what I've always been eating and, and stuff. And after a week, my joints start swelling over start again. Start to get sore again. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like, ah, oh, fuck. Okay. Back to the salad. And then <laughs> just keep on doing what I was doing there. Um, and then there was the Danes deep diving uh, championship in Egypt a few months later. And then, um, yeah, I, I went to that competition also. And I have two days of training uh, before the competition started. I was down, I was following with a guy from Copenhagen, called, a guy called Tua. You have two days of training before the competition. And I was telling him about my trip to Egypt with Jonathan on the way down there and I was how I was pretty hooked about the snow fin thing. Forty five meters and it was really easy. So I, I would two days we have I would try to do a fifty meter dive. Uh, see how it goes. So well, we started up the first day and I did fifty meter dive snow fins and it was coming up like wow, this this is amazing and it's really easy for me. I was thinking maybe sixty is not so bad either. So we actually tried 60 meters the day after, and it was the same feeling. Did that too, no problem, yeah. Yeah, no problem, it was really nice. And um, but two of he was saying it's, it's really big jumps that you were doing. It's really, it's a little bit crazy. He has not done anything like that, and he's been free diving for many years. But he want just to tell me something that there actually is a, the Danish national record at that time was 68 meters. Oh, that <laughs> it could really be cool if I can do a national record for the first competition dive in deep diving. It could be crazy. And there, there was no rule about how many meters you can put on at the time. So uh, I, I announced 70 meters, no fence, for my first competition dive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I did it. I nailed it. Get this. That's on record. Congratulations! That's uh, oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it was. <laughs> just to just to ask out of curiosity, um, when you said that there was no limit to how many meters you could add on at that time, is there a limit now in competition? You cannot put more than three meters on. Three meters over your PB, and that's it's a really good idea. You know? Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, seventy meters is um is a huge dive. Totally. I could have been badly squeezed and everything. It's, it's, but but I, I didn't know it was dangerous. Uh, I, I didn't know it was I can do something wrong. I just remember what Johnny said. Just do what, just relax, chin in and stuff. And I was just doing that. But I, I got a little bit trouble with equalizing. So I went to 70, uh, free immersion and, and constantly with fins also because I couldn't equalize more than 70. So were, were you already using a a mouthful at this time or were you just working with your residual volume i was just trying <laughs> <laughs> just whatever whatever worked yeah. well what is this it, ah, this feels good no pain in my ears okay i do something <laughs> right but i was trying to make the mouthful work but i was i couldn't i was swallowing when i get to 70 so but i did all three disciplines and get a second place in this national record second place in the national record um incredible yeah it was pretty amazing so I went home again, sell everything that I got, and then I went to Egypt again. <laughs> I think in 2014, I was in Egypt seven times or something. Right. So, I mean, at this time, um, you had already, your family had already broken up, right? So you didn't really have anything to hold you in Denmark or stop you from taking up free diving full time at this point. I have my kids. You know? it was, I, I couldn't get away from my kids for a longer period. I couldn't do that. So... But yeah, if I didn't have my kids, I was, I've not been living in Denmark now, I think. I want to be around my kids and uh, I was always, always want to be there. Um, and now yeah, yeah, I got a girlfriend also. Um, so, but she's also traveling, traveling a lot. So, um, that's, that's fine. So your kids, are your kids, uh, 
have they got into free diving yet? Do you think that's going to happen? Uh, no, we have played around in the pool. Uh, my oldest daughter, she's, into, she's doing a lot of sprints, uh, 25 meters with a monofin on. Easy. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But they're, no, but they're enjoying me, uh, that I can tell them f about what I'm doing and, uh, um, they're proud about the fathers that do that. Um, that was pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's your achievements. Um, pretty amazing for someone who's essentially just starting out in the sport. But I mean, I think like, uh, you know, re relaxation and being able to relax to a very deep and profound level is, um, incredibly important in free diving. And maybe it, maybe with the, your experience of, trying to uh, deal with your pain through relaxation gave you an advantage in that regard so that when you did eventually go and dive deep for the first time you had this uh, you had some experience relaxing fully maybe much yeah. more than a lot of people really understand how to do that, that's how i see it Devin, because and you are also under a big pressure if you have when you have all this pain and pain attacks and you, you're actually getting more and more scared, you know, what, how it's going to be next time. And so you have a lot of tension all the time. But then the relaxation showed me it's so much easier to deal with if you're totally relaxed. And the panayama definitely helped me to be totally relaxed too. And the breath hold just made it even better. So you say you practice, um, because I know yoga is a big part of uh, your life now, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, is that something that you practice every day in some form? Do you do some pranayama every day, some meditation every day? Um, meditation I'm doing in the pool now. I'm not sitting home and and doing meditations. It's yeah, sometimes, but it's, it's more in the pool. Um, doing breath hold, yeah, doing static. But I'm doing some a little bit of routine almost every day. And then I have uh, my yoga times two two times a week in hot yoga. So twice a week you'll do some uh, hot uh, yoga yoga Intense postures. Yoga. It's, it's um, for one and a half hour in 40 degrees. So Yeah, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's, you know, my, my, originally I was um, practicing uh, uh, Ashtanga Vinyasa yoga. And um, yeah, you tend to get, uh, <laughs> you tend to get pretty hot when you do that. And the sweating and um, the sweating and the tension for such a long period, um, it has amazing, amazing benefits on the body. Totally. I always used to uh, have problems with my knees and my legs up until mm. the point when I started, um, you know, because I've been a runner all my life. I've been running since I was about 12, lots of like hills and long distance. And, uh, but I always had problems with my knees and my legs. And, um, and then I started to do Ashtanga Vinyasa and I think, it essentially, my knee problems just disappeared, you know, within the first couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've never, I've never had any problems with them again, you know, uh, 10 years later. So, you know, but there are many other benefits too. I think it's because of your, your, that you're not pushing so much pressure on your, on your joints, but you have a really big blood, blood shift, blood flow doing this. And it's in a good kind of way. It's a very uh, low, low impact. There's no, um, violence or you know muscle tearing or anything like this it's just um isometric holds so the building a lot of support around the joints mm -hmm. and you're not really doing them any damage in the same way you would if you were you know pounding up and down a mountain or something like that it is um, quite amazing <laughs> so i understand that you prioritize an alkaline diet could you maybe just um for the listeners explain exactly what an alkaline diet is and how it affects your health and how it affects your free diving performance. Yeah. Alkaline diet, some of the name for it, someone is calling it inflammation, non-inflammation food. When, when you're eating alkaline, you're actually eating food that is faster digest in your body. It's, it's vegetables, it's fruit, and it's nuts. And that's actually it. You don't have any... You can have, I, I'm eating a little bit of chicken, a little bit of fish, but not more than I don't know, 200 grams a week. 
So essentially, it's it's almost a fully plant based diet that you eat. Yeah, but no sugar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a uh, lot of vegetarian is eating a lot of sugar. Right. Yeah, it's it's really bad for the body. Actually, when people are stopping eating sugar, they're getting headache uh, for for up to two weeks. So it's it's pretty crazy what the sugar is doing to us. But it's the sweetness. It's really something every every people when they just try it and just want to have more of it. Uh, so, but you, you can you can get sweetness from from fruit and um, uh, eating some really dark chocolates, and it, it doesn't. It's it's okay to do that. So, when I have craving for sweet stuff, I'm eating some almonds and some dark chocolate, and then it's, it's fine. It's fine again. Or oh, some mangoes and stuff what i can find but it, it's it can be sometimes you're really missing just to eat what you want and do what you want not be that you have to have the strict routine every day but sometimes i've been close to call up the doctor and say can i get some pills again just just for two weeks and then eat normally but now it, it's fine uh, the last one and a half year i don't I don't miss it anymore. Like uh, it's, it's, and every people around me they know what I'm eating. So when we are invited out, there's food for me also. So there, there's there's no problem to it. Yeah, but I think it's an amazing uh, it's an amazing message. The power of a plant based diet and what it can do for you um, mm-hmm. when you simplify what you eat and eat this. Uh, easy to digest alkaline forming foods and remove refined sugars and um and uh sweet things from your diet and then it can have a really profound effect on your health you know and it's a shame that so many people are in such a bad way they have such you know serious health problems and uh that the solution to their health problem is actually on their plate Mm -hmm. it really comes down to what they put in their mouth but rather than changing what they put in their mouth, they'll go to the doctor and they'll, you know, end up on pills and statins and, you know, anti-cholesterol medication and things like this. And uh, it's just crazy, you know, it's just... Yeah, it is. And then the doctor doesn't want to hear anything about yeah, food. Well, I mean, doctors are not trained in uh, nutrition, you know. A doctor might go to uh, go to medical school for 10 years and he might only do four hours of uh, nutrition study 10 years. You know, that's absolutely normal. Uh, it's insane, actually. <laughs> but that it, uh, I try to be an inspiration to other people with uh, some of the disease that I got, and I'm starting to help other people with uh, diseases, and um, they're having the same <laughs> effects. Mm-hmm. So yeah. It's, uh, and then when I'm not free, I mean, I need to do something else, and I still want to make purpose in life. You know, like um, have this identity again. Uh, and when I'm out free diving, it's fine. But when I'm back home, I need really need to do something. Um, uh, so I'm starting to teach other people how to do a healthy uh, living style. You've not just uh, you not just, didn't just get some national records from uh, for Denmark um, and do well in that competition. But I mean, last year you were you got the silver medal at Vertical Blue. Yeah, yeah. And uh before that in 2015 bronze medal, the um uh the World Cup you wrote here. Is that the same thing as the World Championships? The yeah, World Championship. I got it in uh, Nofins. Right. I mean, that's incredible. This is um you know, you've gone from essentially being crippled to being at the very very top of the free diving pretty much as far as you can go in free diving in the space of mm. uh, a few short years. It's incredibly inspirational. Yeah, and I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. And what what kind of training do you do now? Like, are you essentially in Denmark doing most of your training in the pool or are you getting to train depth regularly as well? No, we, we, have, we have a lake in Denmark uh, called Fursøen. It's uh, for 37 meters deep. It's pitch black. In <laughs> four degrees, and I don't want to go there. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, totally amazing. Uh, I've been there two times, and I never go there again. It is too cold. It's not. It's just unpleasant to go there. Um, so I'm doing 
did all my training in the pool. And I still have big problems with my legs that they are too weak because they've not been for those four years that I was they were really bad. I was not using my legs and there's a lot right. of muscles just it's not working. So the muscles kind of atrophied to a certain extent. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and I um so I've always had problem with the fin, constant weight with the fin. Um, I can easily come down, but I cannot come up again. So <laughs> I, right now, I'm just trying to find the right fin. It's, it's a big problem. Um, and I, but I think this one I have now is probably the best one out of those four that I got now. And what what fins are those? Um, I was the first fin I got was a star fin. Uh, stiffness free, and um, I switched from starfin to light, and but it was kind of the same. I, I think it was the same stiffness. I didn't feel anything else about it. But then I bought a brand new light fin uh, with carbon, and it was really really nice to to dive with. But when I was doing over a hundred meter dives, when I was around. There was 40 meter lift, then it was just like pushing a button and my legs didn't work anymore. So I have to swim up with my arms. So I was doing quite a few blackouts because of that. Uh, and in the pool, my legs were starting not to work after 100, 150 meters. It was really, like really annoying. And in, in January, I was down at uh, free uh, free dive down with Steve and he got a multi fin laying around and I was just trying that it was too small and it was really soft but it was just perfect for me um, yeah my dive time was a little bit slow but I didn't have any pain in my legs so I I bought one when I get home and um it makes a really big difference. My dive time a little bit longer, but I don't, my legs is not burning out so fast. So I think it should be possible to come up now. <laughs> right. <laughs> On my dives. Uh, so this, um, so, new mulching of monofin that you got seems to make a big difference for you. Yeah. Uh, up to now, it's, it's really a big difference. I try, I have been trained for it for four weeks now, uh, almost every day. Um, and I switched over to the light fin and I was really fast. It was amazing how fast I was. But after 100 meters, my legs just died out again. So it's too stiff with this technique that I got, uh, or maybe it's too weak. But if, if I will have stronger legs, then maybe that light fin is better for me. Uh, so, but now, right now, it seems like this multi fin is really doing the job. So are you, are you doing any other kinds of training, um, to support your free diving, such as like, uh, maybe like, I mean, for your legs, are you doing any kind of like squatting or like oh, high intensity okay. interval training or anything like that? I have tried many times, but every time I do that, uh, my legs, my, my knees start to swallow up. So if I put too much pressure on them, um, yeah. So that inflammation in your knee joint is really holding you back in that regard. Yeah, yeah. For, for, for harder training. Uh, and when they swallows up, they can go three weeks before they're down again, and it's not. It's I can then I cannot train anymore. Yeah. So I need to, need to find this balance all the time. But I can do a little bit of bicycling. Uh, that's it, actually. And then I'm just doing a lot of swimming, and uh, a lot of swimming with the the fin, and then yeah practice uh, hot yoga a lot when you're diving depth uh no fins is your favorite discipline oh, yeah free motion mm -hmm. yeah. or free immersion so, yeah. well where i can use my arms <laughs> yeah yeah so what um what kind of depth are you diving now in no fins ah uh, so 75 it's not that i have improved so much in the no fins dive um but, um 75 76 uh yeah. And you, you dive to, um, to 95 meters, uh, free immersion. Is that right? Uh, 102. 102 meters free immersion now. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> um, 
I think my first national record in free motion was 90 meters. Oh, sorry, 91. Then the other guy, Jesper from Denmark, he, he did 97 suddenly. They're like, wow, that's a big jump. So uh, from last year, I've gone from 98 to 102. I did 102 in Bahamas. Yeah, so how did it feel when you uh, broke through the 100 meter mark? Oh, this was scary. <laughs> I don't know why, because this 100 thing, it's just a really big number. And um, I, I think there's a lot of freedivers when they're doing the 100 for the first time. It's it's not going too good. <laughs> because I was really happy when I reached the bottom plate and like, on the bottom, yes, I did it, and uh, and then when I turned, and just uh, it, it's just too long way up. Um, I'm not sure that I can come up to the surface again. So, so I blacked out at the first time when I did it on. But but it's it's really a cool thing to do uh, over 100 meters. Yeah, it's still still completely unimaginable for me, but um, yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe one day. <laughs> Yeah, we have an a, a t- antenna where my kids are living, and they're 102 meters high. You can stand and look up. Yeah, that's so when you look at the antenna, you kind of get a you get a good idea of just how deep it is you're actually di- diving. Yeah, because it's really, really high. Yeah. No? <laughs> wow, uh, that's crazy. Yeah, but the, the best thing is just you're free falling longer, and that that's ooh, it's so nice. It's amazing. Uh, I don't know, it's like you get addicted to that because some of the dives that you got, you are so high on this feeling that it uh, you cannot find this high and it's somewhere else, I don't think. It's like, oh, it's so really safe in some kind of weird way. But uh, I feel like I am really get chucked in and, and it's yeah, just getting nicer and nicer the deeper you go. Yeah, I've heard that it's uh, the sensation is like being hugged by the ocean. Exactly, and then you feel more and more safe down there. <laughs> it's a bit weird, right? You feel more and more safe, even though you're sort of moving into a more and more dangerous space. But somehow, exactly. and, and this, 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 when everything is right, your mind is mindset is right, and everything, then yeah, you you're searching for this special life. Again and again and again and again. So it's something people get addicted to. Yeah, I mean, it's like um, when you reach that point when it's when the sport or the discipline that you're doing is giving you that level of uh, satisfaction and pleasure. It's only natural that you want to take it further and further, right? And the other thing, I have some. My knees is is much more better today than it was uh, three years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have some changes in my back that, well, yeah, this, this pain is not so easy to get rid of. Yeah. Uh, but after uh, diving deep, when I'm past the 90, three days in a row, then they're totally gone. Do you think that has something to do with the uh, pressure at that depth? Like maybe, uh, maybe it's a kind of a. St- some quality of the pressure on the on the joints at that depth is giving you some kind of physical relief. Yeah, I'm pretty sure about it. Uh, in Argentina, they're using pressure chamber or horses when they have uh, bad joints. Yeah, we human are not costing twenty million euros, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so you're not quite ready to install one in your uh, living room then. Oh, I will be. If I get the money for it, I will definitely. <laughs> um, and I've also tried to get in a chamber in Denmark, see if there's some someone in, in some hospitals. But they're saying it. Uh, I should have a bigger effect of it for a longer period. Um, sometimes I don't. I only have this nice effect for two, three days, but sometimes it's up to a week or maybe a little bit more. Uh, without any kind of pain just to be on pressure Mm -hmm. it's very interesting you know maybe you should get in touch with um like a medical university and suggest that they do some kind of research on you oh i've tried that so many times oh you really have you already yeah yeah, we have someone that's doing research now 
uh, but it, it's it's a long long research and I've been doing a lot of refold in, in scanners MR scanners um, they're taking blood samples uh, muscle samples and doing a lot of testing on me mm-hmm. and have you found anything interesting out through all these tests yeah the free diving is really good for you <laughs> yeah um, that's good to know <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, something that's pretty amazing it's um, pe- sick people that's laying in the bed the whole day uh, they're not we can actually do cardio training with them, just laying still, doing breath hold. If you can improve your cardio when you're sick, then you're healing up faster. Uh, I have I have one patient with a really bad heart, uh, and he should actually have a new heart, but he was, he's too scared to go into this operation. So we, we, we changed his diet completely and we were starting to doing breath hold. Uh, but because of his heart is so bad, he could, uh, he did 10 seconds for the first two or three days. He's, uh, he almost have a, he has a little bit of fluid in his lungs because the heart is so bad. He has no, um, blood circulation in his legs. They're almost black. And, um, he was not weighing too much. He may be weighing 10 kilos too much, but it's not so badly. Uh, but the diet that make him get rid of the, the 10 kilos and, um, the breath hold was doing his heart stronger. So the next time he was at the doctor's, he was, um, the heartbeat was so much better that he, he actually didn't know what was yeah, I've never seen anything like that. Before. Right, he'd never seen that kind of improvement before, just from some some apnea training. You know, the the pulse is going down when you're holding up this, and it's going pretty high up when we start breathing again. That, that that's normal. We know that, so free divers. But as a sick person, uh, it just make your it's a kind of cardio training. So it's a really cool way to. If you are sick, to get started again, uh, it's it's pretty fascinating. Um, yeah. So, so all the other three divers, when we're getting old, we have to learn what the sick people to do breath hold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you said uh, when you were in the pool, uh, you you've had a few blackouts training in the pool. No, it's from the deep. Uh, from the depth. Yeah. So, um, I, have, I only have one little blackout in the pool have you have you witnessed any bad accidents in in your time as a free diver have you seen any bad accidents or had a bad accident yourself yeah the one i did in 2014 at the world championship may 13 mm-hmm. uh, so what happened pretty, to you there uh i was uh, doing 73 no offense um and uh, I was pretty comfortable that I could do that. It was, I was, because the 70 was so, so easy, but it wasn't Kalamata. It was a little bit colder water. Right. And I actually don't know why I was hyperventilating before I dived, but I was. And I blacked out 20 meters before the service and get squeezed and yeah, and get really scared. Uh, you blacked out at 20 meters and you got squeezed too. And I, I really got scared because it was the first time that I felt anything not nice. Yeah. <laughs> about driving. Um, yeah, you'd been pretty lucky up to that point. Yeah, considering exactly. that you were making such, uh, such huge leaps in your training. And suddenly there was something going wrong and I was, what is that? And then I was a little bit stupid. I saw the video when I was blacking out and it was just getting, <laughs> it was just, it was not making me bitter. Uh, so I actually didn't know what I was, what I should do, but I did a 66 meter dives with my monofin on for the next dive. Uh, but it just to build up some confidence again. And it was, it was good and everything. Why exactly did you 
did this happen to you and how do you think you could have avoided it? So more training and some more knowledge about what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And you and you were hyperventilating before you did that dive too. Yeah, it, it, it was the World Championship. It was right after the Danish Championship in 2013. So I've been diving with Jonathan for two weeks and then at the, world, at the Danish Championship for a week and then the World Championship. So it was not that I've done really much training. I have done my... Uh, four stars and, and stuff but uh but i was not i was yeah i was doing something wrong different and my, my i was nervous it was the world championship and i was freezing and i was hyperventilating yeah. and i was not <clears throat> relaxed yeah, so maybe eventually your your lack of experience caught up with you in the end yeah yeah and i was uh, i was going for the numbers i was not going for the dives right. anymore right like, and when yeah but I learned some good things about it. That you should not you should not try to go after the numbers. You try to go after your lives and um Well yeah, I mean it seems to be a it seems to be um a common theme that these accidents start to happen when the divers go after the numbers. And uh in the worst situation the it can be can be very bad for the diver. Um but in the best situation it's probably the best lesson that they can learn, right? Yeah. Exactly. When you are like me, I'm, I'm in Denmark and I'm traveling to Bahamas or something, and and you're doing something wrong there, and you cannot dive for a few days. It's uh, it's not nice. Yeah, it's painful it's, too. Yeah, we really painful. Yeah. So um, it's not like you live in Indonesia all year round no, and you can just no, I just go out every day, or take a take a week off when you're not feeling like it. So everything has to be kind of way perfect. Yes, yeah, so, I mean your expectations for yourself are too high, aren't they? Yeah. Um, when I went to Bahamas the last time in this year, I was having really big numbers going on, and nothing was working. <laughs> uh, until in the end, I was saying I don't give a fuck about all these numbers. I just want to have my dives, and and then suddenly everything is working again. Um, but yeah, it just shows how much the brain affects you because it's just stuff that you're thinking, you know, and that's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how our mind is affecting our body in so many incredible ways. And as we go about our day to day life, you know, maybe just like going to work in the office, you know, going to the restaurant, you know, playing with the kids, we don't really, we, we kind of lose sight of our body and mm-hmm. we kind of live in our head too much, I think. Um, and that leads to all kind of problems. But then once you get in the water and you're diving, and especially once you start diving deep and you start diving to, you know, uh, really deep, like you have done in your case, you know, at, at that point, you can, you, you have to have the mind and the body cooperating with each other. And you have to have a good connection between the mind and the body. And you need to understand and you need to feel what is happening there on a deep level just to stay safe. Right, yeah. and yeah. if you if you start concentrating too much on the numbers, then it becomes a mind game again, and you forget the body, and that separation takes place, and a lot of things can go wrong then. Exactly, and this yeah, that's how it is in the world. If you are out working and you you are thinking too much, sometimes you just you can do you can easily do your work. But you can also think too much about it, so you can fuck everything up. Uh, I think it's you can use this technique in so many other places to have this nice feeling going on with the good balance in, in your your mind. And so. so let's um let's talk a little bit about your gear. Like, what do you what do you like to use in the water? Um, yeah, a nice wetsuit. Uh, I'm using uh, Alias. Um, do you get them custom made, Alias? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's yeah, I really love those suits. It's so nice to have one. And then I have yeah, no strip. I was using uh, Tricon for the first yeah three years, and now I tried this Octopus, uh, the big. Uh, classic thing it's mm-hmm. really nice you like that yeah 
Yeah, yeah. Do, um, do you also, have you tried, um, do you wear fluid goggles or have you tried them? Yeah, I've tried, but it's, it's not nice. I, I don't, you know, it, it's maybe I just have to get used to it. I don't know, but I just try it once and it's fuck, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to use that. Yeah, Tim Umigan said the same thing. He said that it, it makes him feel like he's drunk when he wears them. Um, yeah, and you have this pressure on your eyes. It is, you know, ah, no, it's not nice. Uh-huh. So when, you, when you're diving no fins, do you also wear the Elios wetsuit and wear it with the, with the hood? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, a lot of people think I need to have an orca to do this, but... Uh, I like to have this hood on. It's like to get in, in a little cave, you know, and it's nice and comfy and um, so, yeah, that, that, that's, for me, it's, it's really nice. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit cavey thing. <laughs> and what about fins? Um, are you also using the, the Molchanov in the, uh, for depth? Yeah. Um, yeah, right now I just, uh, using this uh, new monofin for Multinova and um, it, it seems that it's going to make the job from now. Uh, but I will bring both of my fins to, to Rotan for the World Championship just to try them out in the deep. But um, I think the Multinova is the one I'm going to mm-hmm. use. This and, uh, sorry, just to ask again, what, what's the other fin that you use? That's the glide fin, carbon glide fin. And you don't wear a mask on any of your dives? No, not at all. Just a nose clip and the, the suit. Yeah, my lanyards, of course. So have you have you done much traveling for diving? Like, uh, do you have any any favorite dive sites? Yeah, I, I really like to go to Dahab. Uh, what is it about Dahab that you like so much? Uh, it's cheap to go there. Right, yeah. Uh, that's one thing. And there's always free divers there. And I like the corals to go diving and see some of the corals afterwards. It's really nice. Mm-hmm. So when you go to Dahab, um, who do you dive with? Is there a dive center there or organization? I have free dive with Steve. Um, Steve, they have been this, on the safety team at the Vertical Blue for the last, I don't know, three years or something. Uh, Steve, what's his uh, surname? Um, he's uh, Irish, he's right? Steve Kinnon. He is Irish, and I was in this Christmas period uh, last year. I have a really bad, bad pain in my back, and I was so I just I need to get away. I need to go diving and do something. And I went to to down to Steve in January. It was just nice. Everything is just set up. Everything is just working, and uh, it's it's pretty cool what he's he's doing. Um, are there any places that you've heard about that you haven't been to yet that you'd really like to go to? Uh, I would love to go and see Kate and Mike. Uh, yeah, Frida Gilly. Um, but we're talking about it every time. Now we have to go. Uh, then there's this place, Jonathan, uh, setting up in Dominica. It's looking really cool also. And that's was actually the plan that I should go to Jonathan this year. But... Um, I don't think I get enough sponsorships, so it's possible. Well, I hope you, I hope you really get the chance to go to those places. Um, I actually did my first free diving course at uh, Kate and Mike's place in uh, Indonesia. Yeah, and it's yeah, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. The location is amazing. It truly, is a paradise island, and uh, their facilities are incredible too. Very, very nice facilities. Just nice twenty-five meter pool beside the shop and then it's like a you know 15 second walk onto the beach climb onto the boat oh, yeah. and then in 15 minutes you're in very deep water yeah and then spend some time with Kate and Mike they're really cool so <laughs> it's uh yeah, yeah it's could be really cool so hopefully I get to those two places <laughs> in, in the next year or two and now I just yes yeah, Rotten coming up I've not been to Rotten before uh, so I'm looking forward to see that also yeah, so you'll be looking forward to a bit of um, the tropical weather as well, right? Yeah, I really like that. Uh, yeah. The warm thing is so much nicer. Um, it's not the summer is like it's not going so good in Denmark with the summer right now. I don't envy you as a free diver having to uh, 
spend extended periods of time in in Denmark. Mm-hmm. But I guess it makes it all the more sweeter when you do actually get the chance to go somewhere like Dahab or Roatan. Yeah, you, you are really you're enjoying it much more. I think. Yeah, um, you can appreciate it a lot more. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. And this year, I'm only going two times for this year, so it's, it's yeah, it's a little bit too little. I think it's I should have more deep training uh, to do some bigger numbers. I think, but yeah, that's how it is. Yeah, it's costs a lot of money, and this year everything is in in um, the Caribbean, and it's it's really expensive. Yeah, it's so to far so hard to get to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really hope that you. Uh, I really hope that you have a great competition there. It seems seems like you don't really need much help. You seem to be doing okay as you are. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll be keeping yeah. a close eye on you and uh, cheering for you. Oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah. So a fun uh, fun question that I kind of like to ask the guests is about your morning ritual. You know, I'm like always really interested to find out if there's some kind of ritual that you have when when you wake up. For me personally, like. It's really important to have a ritual in the morning. Otherwise, I wouldn't yeah. get anything done. You know, I would just like end up staying in bed all day. So do you have anything like that? I know you do some yoga every day, but is there a kind of a, a schedule that you follow? Or The best thing is to get up almost an hour before the other guy's getting up. And then I have my coffee. This nice cup of coffee in the morning is <laughs> a really big thing for me. Uh and then I, uh, after an hour or something, I, I have my breakfast. Um, but this half an hour almost that I got every morning by myself and, and no kids, no nothing is just, just nice and quiet. Uh, it, I, I need that every morning to get started. Just everything has to go really slowly for the, definitely the first hour in the morning. And then we can start building up tempo. <laughs> uh, but uh, but actually, I'm I'm not doing any yoga in the morning. I'm too stiff, uh, and it just feels terrible. So normally, I, I'll have my um, coffee, and then I have my oats, um, and then I get a for a walk with the dogs or something. And then I can do some stretching, some yoga. Stuff. Yeah, that must be so nice, and the. Danish countryside to go out in the morning and go for a walk. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, so an- another question that um, I'm always really intrigued to ask um, just people in general, um, but I'm going to ask all the guests on this show is, um, do you have a, a book that you would like to recommend to the listeners or a favorite book? Yeah, but it's, yeah. but it's not one book. Oh, well, you can books. list several <laughs> if you like. <laughs> It's a series. Uh, the the writer is Johan Nisbø, a Swedish writer, and he had uh, made this character called Harald Hul. Uh, he is a alcoholic policeman, um, but he's really cool. <laughs> so is this like a crime uh, novel? Yeah, mm-hmm. totally crime. Uh, He's getting in up out of this alcohol thing, so sometimes he's clean, sometimes he's not. Uh, but there's ten books about him; they're just incredible. So, is that kind of like the the kind of book that you would like to read if you had some time on the beach and you you wanted to take something, uh, you know, not too not too serious to read? Yeah, I, I would. I would definitely. Like that, I, I like this is some kind of a cool story, uh, and there have to be a little bit of excitement in it also. So, Stig, if um, if the listeners want to find you on social media, where can they do that? Do you have a website and uh, social media pages? The website is uh, stipuls dot com, uh, and then I have uh, a Facebook free diver Stipuls on Facebook. And um, Instagram is steepus seventy three, uh, and you can uh, you can find me on App Store. I made an app, but it's not in. It's only in Danish. Okay, well that will be good for the Danish listeners. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I'll put I'll put links to all those pages and your website in the show notes so uh the listeners can access them easily. So uh thank you so much, Dick. Um thank you for joining us and sharing your amazing journey. It really is quite an inspirational story. Um I think everyone likes to hear, you know, like a transformational story, um, especially when free diving is involved. Uh, I wish you a really great year. Good luck in the competition next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Yeah. And good luck out of the water as well. Good luck with everything else that you decide to do. And uh, dive safe. I will do that. You too. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ronnie. So that was Steak Pruj. Isn't that such an inspirational story? To start free diving at the age of 40 and become a national champion in a few short years? All the time battling this terrible and debilitating disease and ultimately transcending the pain in the free fall and the deep. Thank you so much for listening, people. Remember to subscribe to the show through your favorite podcast provider so you don't miss an episode and share the Free Dive Cafe with your friends. Until next time, dive safe.